it's a great pleasure to have Nicole Haynes here today. She's going to be talking about an area that is sort of always promising a lot, not quite sure it's uh, delivered, uh, immunotherapy. Nicole did a PhD in the Peter Mac uh, and then went to uh, UCSF uh, California working with Jason's sister to do a four-year postdoc, and now she's come straight back home. <laughs> so um, without further introduction, I'd like you to thank uh, Nicole for coming, give us a talk. Well, thank you very much for the introduction um, to come and present here today. Um, as John said, my name's Nicole. I am a senior research officer. I work within the Cancer Therapeutics Program at the Peter Mac. Essentially, I am trained as an applied tumour immunologist, so I am particularly interested in studying the immune system and how it functions or does not function in the context of cancer and trying to utilise this information in order to rationally design and test uh, their novel therapeutic strategies for the treatment of, of cancer. Given my background, I thought that for today's presentation I'd give a general overview of some of what's currently known about how the immune system can impact upon cancer development and progression, as well as how it can influence uh, the way in which cancers respond to um, uh, therapeutic strategies. Certainly this area of um, tumour immunology and immunotherapy is gaining significant momentum and there's a lot of work in this act active work going on both in the preclinical setting and the clinical setting, given the fact that it is becoming increasingly increasingly more evident that we are going to have to integrate parameters pertaining to both the host as well as the tumour if we're to effectively treat established and as particularly that of metastatic um, uh, cancer. So just as a very brief introduction to the immune system, and I do apologise if uh, this is very basic and, um, and, and you're all aware of this, however, I just thought it was an important interlude to this particular talk. So all cells of the immune system arise from a, a hemopoietic stem cell, um, from the bone marrow that gives rise to two, two um, progenitor um, uh, lineage populations, including that of the, the common myeloid progenitor lineage and the common lymphoid progenitor lineage. These lineages essentially give rise to an array of uh, immune components that make up the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system. The innate immune component, which is made up of cytotoxic lymphocytes, including natural killer cells, granulocytic cells, such as that of neutrophils, as well as antigen-presenting cells, such as um, dendritic cells and macrophages, essentially this is our first, provide the first line of defence um, against the um, foreign um, pathogens, as well as that of cancers. The innate immune system, it tends to be, those responses tend to be very rapid. Um, they tend to be directed at around uh, and non-specific um, or not directed towards any specific antigen. Um, and they don't have the capacity to evoke an immunological memory. Um, in contrast, the adaptive arm of the immune system comprises of a series of small lymphocytic popu uh, cell populations, including T lymphocytes made up of CD4 T helper cells and CD8 cytotoxic lymphocytes, and B cells, which are the primary um, antibody producing cells of the immune system. Collectively, the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system have an integral role to play in influencing the, the natural and as well as therapy-induced history of cancer evolution. So the field of cancer immunology has been one that's been dealt with a, a number of challenges and certainly a, lot, a number of controversies. The idea that the immune system played a role in controlling cancer development or shaping the nature of the disease has, was a, a long-term debate. It was actually last, uh, went for well over a century. The idea that the immune system could actually play a role in controlling cancers, I suppose, was first proposed uh, in the early 1900s by Paul Ehrlich, who proposed that, that if it wasn't for a functional or a, a fully competent immune system, that cancers would be quite common in long-lived organisms. However, at this time, there was so little known about the components of the immune system and how they functioned that there was really no effective way of testing or validating this hypothesis. It wasn't really for another 50 years um, uh, with the work of um, Thomas and Burnett that the idea of cancer immunosurveillance was uh, re-emerged. Re uh, and these guys really essentially proposed that the immune system, or particularly that of the adaptive immune system, could play an important role in protecting against the development of cancers. However, at this time, at the same time, there was a number of research groups that also argued against this idea of the cancer immunosurveillance hypotheses, suggesting that uh, tumour cells would not present um, uh, uh, danger signals that would alert the immune system to their presence, and as well as this, that given the fact that tumours arise from self-tissue, that they would likely present 
and antigens that would induce immune tolerance. Further to this, there was also information to suggest that um, innate pro-inflammatory responses could actually um, promote cancer development, and it was this fact that they felt that would prohibit the protective mechanisms of the immune system in controlling uh, cancer development. It wasn't really until um, uh, the uh, late uh, 1900s, well, around about 1990s, with the development of a wide array of immunodeficient mouse, uh, mouse models on a very de uh, defined genetic background that this idea of cancer immunosurveillance re-emerged. Essentially, they identified that mice that were deficient of adaptive immune um, components, particularly that of TMB cells, or lacked um, uh, the production of immunomodulatory cytokines, such as interferon gamma, or effector pathways that could mediate tumour cell um, killing, um, that they found that they, these mice were more prone or susceptible to the spontaneous development of carcinogen-induced tumours, as well as spontaneous tumour growth. And certainly a number of groups went on to validate these findings, confirming the idea that the immune system did have the capacity to act as an extrinsic tumour suppressor um, uh, mechanism. So we now do believe that the immune system has pr three primary um, roles in preventive, the prevention of tumours. Um, the first being the timely elimination and suppression of viral infections. Indeed, viruses are thought to contribute or uh, be the reason for around about 15% of all um, uh, cancers worldwide. Um, as well as this, the um, immune system can prevent against cancer development through the timely elimination of pathogens and resolution of inflammatory um, responses, which can be conducive to um, cancer, the transformation process and cancer development. But the most direct mechanism by which the immune system can control, control the development of, of cancers is through the direct elimination of cancer cells through the detection of tumour suppressor associated or tumour specific antigens, as well as molecules associated with cellular stress. This capacity of the immune system to actually detect and recognise tumour cells as, as, as foreign or um, uh, needed to be, to be cleared um, gave rise uh, to uh, this uh, phenomenon of uh, cancer immunosurveillance. So a fundamental tenet of, of tumour immunology um, in general, as well as the, the idea of um, the cancer immunosurveillance um, approach, is that tumour cells have the capacity to express antigens on their surface that can distinguish them from their non-transformed counterparts. And really the idea that um, tumour cells could present antigens that could engage immune effector mechanisms, particularly that of adaptive immune mechanisms, and control cancers was really first established in this setting where they immunised a mouse with a carcinogen-induced um, tumour, um, that being methylcholanthrene. This induced a spontaneous uh, tumour growth. They then looked to see whether they re-challenged these mice with the same tumour, whether these mice could mount a response against this, uh, this tumour, and this was the case. These mice could effectively reject a second challenge with this same tumour. However, mice that had never been exposed to this antigen were in a, uh, incapable of mounting a response. Now, the, they were capable, it was shown that they could transfer this immunity to um, the developing cancer by isolating the CD8 T cells from these mice and transferring these CD8 T cells into these um, uh, mice-bearing established tumours, and these CD8 T cells could effectively mount a response that can control the subsequent uh, tumour growth, therefore validating this concept that the, um, uh, the adaptive immune component of the immune system could effectively mount a response against the tumour antigen, um, and this could evoke an immunological memory response. This kind of really drove um, uh, the um, studies looking for um, tumour antigens or immunogenic tumour antigens that could engage in immunological responses to cancers, uh, some of which are, are presented on this, uh, this slide here. Um, and certainly the, these findings really kind of put to rest this idea that um, tumour antigens tend to just be aberrantly overexpressed normal antigens that would likely um, be uh, tolerised be tolerized, uh, or tolerise the immunological responses and, uh, and prevent the induction of uh, effective anti-tumour immunity. So the study of this uh, of cancer immunosurveillance was um, extensively performed in um, this setting of the MCA or methylcholanthrene induced fibrosarcoma model. Essentially, they studied the outgrowth of spont or spontaneous tumour outgrowth of these methylcholanthrene induced tumours in, in sex and age matched um, wild type and knockout mice, and followed the the latency as well as the the frequency of tumour development over a 50 to 80 day period in this model setting. Importantly, they were able to demonstrate 
demonstrated in this setting that um, uh, in the, the latency and the frequency of, of tumours developing this setting was far more uh, prominent in the RAG2 deficient mice, which are defici defective, deficient for TMB cells, compared to that of uh, the wild-type mice, suggesting that the, a fully competent immune system was necessary in order to protect the host against the outgrowth of, um, uh, of tumours. However, this, did not just, uh, this was not just restricted to the activity of the adaptive immune compartment, um, a, a quite extensive analysis in this particular model, as well as other models of spontaneous cancer, identified that really both innate and adaptive immune components were critical in supporting um, anti-tumor responses um, and protecting the host against the outgrowth of um, uh, tumor growth. The, the combination of molecules involved in this process was very much diff, uh, dictated by the transformation prior, type of transformation process that ensued, the tissue in which these tumours arose in, as well as the, the proliferative activity of um, these uh, cancer cells. So this was all uh, very well and good. This was showing in a preclinical setting that indeed um, the, uh, uh, were supporting this idea of cancer immunosurveillance. However, at the same time, there was important clinical observations to also support this idea of cancer immunosurveillance. And certainly this was supported by the idea that there was patients that were sh um, showing spontaneous rejection of their cancers, as well as that patients that were immunosuppressed were more susceptible to tumour development. But particularly interesting was the finding that the infiltration of TMB cells into the tumour microenvironment did correlate with increased survival of patients in this setting of ovarian cancer, but now this has been extended to other cancers, including melanoma, breast, lung, and, and, and others. So certainly there was a nice correlation between um, T cell infiltration and tumors, into tumours and improved patient uh, survival, again supporting this idea that the immune system could have an important role in shaping um, uh, the disease. One of the most striking examples um, of this idea of cancer immunosurveillance in the clinic uh, is demonstrated in this slide. It was a, a case study in which um, the, this donor um, of, uh, was, uh, who was apparently cured of primary melanoma um, uh, 16 years prior to her death, um, her uh, kidneys were then transplanted into two um, recipients um, and later on they found that both these uh, recipients developed metastatic melanoma. Upon further analysis, they were able to identify that um, this, uh, the donor patient actually had um, uh, small deposits of um, uh, uh, metastatic melanoma that were being kept in check by the immune system. However, once it was, uh, this, uh, the organs were transplanted into an immunosuppressed host, uh, the cancers there, the cancer could then progress and um, uh, and and uh, and grow out. And so again, this was another very uh, um, striking example of the phenomenon of cancer immunosurveillance and the fact that the immune system can effectively um, uh, keep uh, cancer development in check. So now quite a lot of work has been invested into trying to understand whether or identify whether um, the infiltration of immune cells into the tumour microenvironment has any uh, prognostic or therapeutic significance. And um, there is now a lot of work um, in this area and certainly it's been largely driven by work by um, Jerome, Jerome um, Gallon, who I really essentially was able to identify the, the type density and location of immune cells within um, colorectal um, uh, tumours could actually have a, a, a predictive clinical um, outcome. And certainly now this work has been extended to other cancers, um, including uh, the recent work of Shireen Loy in the context of breast cancer, showing that really we need to better understand or, or, or establish protocols where we can identify the, uh, like characterise the immune score um, associated with um, patients' tumours. Essentially, we need to identify the type of uh, cells, immune cells present within the tumour microenvironment, their density as well as their location, as these are important parameters that, um, uh, for prognostic purposes, as well as this influence, uh, maybe also predictive of how a patient may respond um, to therapeutic um, uh, um, uh, uh, treatments. Indeed, um, the chemosensitivity of various treatments has been directly correlated with um, positive um, uh, 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 immune infiltrates. And certainly now we're starting to identify. Um, uh, important gene signatures um, that uh, can be correlated with improved um, patient survival in the, the clinic. 
So there's certainly a substantial amount of evidence to support this idea that the adaptive immune system plays a very important role as well, along with that of the innate immune system, in protecting the host against um, the cancer and also uh, influencing the evolution of the disease. And certainly in order to develop a very effective or, um, a, a, a immune response that can effectively kill the, the um, cancer, it, the, the, the immune system response needs to go through a series of, of, of steps which are uh, presented in this slide here. Uh, this is a very a cyclic process that's likely to be self-propagating um, and but however, in the setting of cancer, this, um, <clears throat> this, uh, this uh, process can be severely um, uh, compromised. Um, and even if a T cell response is actually mounted uh, or evoked within the um, tumour microenvironment or towards the tumour, these invariably um, don't uh, uh, lead to a long-term protective um, immunity. And there's several reasons for this. One of which is um, this concept of immunoediting. Um, now, while the immune system really does have an important role in controlling cancers, the pressure that the immune system actually exerts on a developing tumour in order to control it can actually cause the tumour to undergo further changes, which in order to, to promote or prolong its, uh, its survival and persistence. And certainly, um, you can get the, uh, this process of immunoselection, so you get the outgrowth of um, tumour cells that have, don't have the capacity to evoke immunological responses or have the capacity to secrete factors that can effectively dampen um, uh, effective uh, immune responses. And this idea of immunoediting is presented in this slide here. Again, we revisit this, uh, uh, this model of this methylclanthrin-induced um, uh, uh, spontaneous tumour model. In this setting, what they did was they actually isolated tumours that grew out in the RAG1 knockout versus the wild type and retransplanted these uh, tumours into either uh, immune-compromised or wild-type animals. As would be expected when you transfer the wild type or RAG2 knockout tumours into immunocompromised hosts, the tumours effectively grew out in all mice. However, what was interesting is when you transplanted the, the mice from um, the, the wild type animals, these tumours in the when they were sorry, when these tumours were implanted into wild type mice, all the tumours grew out. There was no capacity of the immune system to control the development of these tumours, suggesting that the tumours had undergone immunological uh, um, uh, immuno, immunoselection in order to um, select for tumours that were now um, uh, protected from immune control. This wasn't the case in the co uh, context of the RAG2 deficient animals where you could see that these tumours um, actually were rejected or a large percentage of these tumours were rejected, suggesting that they were, they were uh, poorly immuno-edited um, and, uh, and so they still had the capacity to evoke um, potent immunological responses that could control the disease. In addition to uh, the immunoselection process of uh, cancers, um, this cycle, um, this uh, cancer Im Im immunity cycle, is very tightly regulated by both uh, 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 stimulatory as well as inhibitory mechanisms in order to ensure that autoimmunity um, or proliferal tolerance is not, not affected uh, or impacted upon. Uh, and certainly, cancers can actually um, uh, capitalize on or hijack these various um, inhibitory mechanisms associated with controlling this pathway in order to permit um, their, their survival. However, one of the most um, prominent and most, uh, most very one of the most rate lim or dominant rate limiting steps in the generation of effective anti-tumor immune response to, to cancers is this idea of the generation of a, a, a strong immunosuppressive um, tumor microenvironment. And there's a number of factors that can contribute to this, but certainly uh, one of the most uh, interesting elements of this is that tumors can secrete factors that can draw, draw in um, uh, regulatory or immunosuppressive um, immune cells into the tumor microenvironment. Some of the well known, most well-known of these are T regulatory cells, which is a subpopulation of um, T cells with a, a CD4 um, uh, backbone. These uh, T regulatory cells have a really um, uh, important role in maintaining immune cell hemostasis. However, um, uh, they, they, they have a very, in the context of cancers, they have a very dominant immunosuppressive kind of activity and can limit the generation of effective anti-cancer immune responses. Further to this, we also have the myeloid derived suppressor cells, which is an immature uh, myeloid uh, population of cells. Their expansion and suppressive activity um, uh, can be uh, significantly enhanced through um, exposure or um, persistence within chronic inflammatory environments that are um, consistent with that of, of cancers. And we also have tumour associated macrophages here as well. Um, this is uh, macrophages, are certainly a very plastic population, and their, their phenotype can be very, very much dictated by. 
um, uh, 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 signaling uh, um, the signals that they receive from the environment. And given that the tumour microenvironment tends to be a very immunosuppressive one, it's not surprising that macrophages take on more of a suppressive role within the tumour microenvironment in order to promote its survival. So certainly there are a number of regulatory elements um, that can control and limit the development of effective anti-cancer immune responses. Um, and as we, we can all agree on, I'm sure, is that the immune system and cancer are very distinct cellular systems, but they can have a very profound impact on one another. And given the complexity of these interactions, we still don't know all the variables um, that can um, control the capacity of the immune system to mediate a primary, uh, primarily uh, protective versus versus a, 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 um, a mechanisms that can promote tumour development. But I think um, with uh, the increasing uh, load of, of preclinical and clinical information, we're moving in the right direction in order to try and promote these host immune um, uh, uh, mechanisms uh, in order to um, protect against cancer development. However, based on the information that we have to date, there is now a lot of activity um, going on preclinically and within the clinic, trying to utilise the information that we now know about uh, tumour surveillance as well as the factors that can promote tumour escape. And certainly now there's a lot of effort being um, uh, invested into identifying ways of trying to promote anti-tumour immunity um, through thera therapeutic mechanisms. Now, given that we know that in order to activate the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system, they really need to be exposed to um, danger signals or um, a, a detect immunogenic factors within the tumour microenvironment, a lot of work in, in, has been invested in trying to identify um, uh, first-line therapies or cytotoxic therapies that actually can kill tumour cells in a manner that can effectively engage immune effector mechanisms. And certainly a wide array of um, therapeutic agents have now been examined, um, including that of anthracycline, such as that of doxorubicin, histone deacetylase inhibitors, as well as radiation therapy. And some of the, these um, therapeutic strategies have been identified to have the capacity um, to kill tumour cells in a manner that that can engage effective mechanisms through either altering the antigenicity of tumour cells or the immunogenicity of um, the uh, presented antigens, promoting immune cell responses as well as um, resetting the immunosuppressive microenvironment of the, the tumour. And certainly, based on uh, this slide, I know it's very complex, but this is just to show that a lot of preclinical work has been done to examine um, the efficacy of these various FDA-approved um, uh, therapeutic agents in um, immune-deficient mouse models of cancer. And they've been able to show that, that immune deficiency can actually significantly impact on the therapeutic capability of these, um, uh, these reagents. And certainly, with the, the, this increasing understanding of how these therapeutic first-line therapies and chemotherapeutics work, we're likely to start utilising these in a far more effective manner that's going to not only kill the cancer cell but also engage immune effector mechanisms that can evoke durable um, and robust anti-cancer immune responses. However, given the, the array of barriers that do exist to the, uh, the generation of effective anti-cancer immune response, it's unlikely that any one of these, um, uh, uh, these therapeutic agents will be sufficient in effectively controlling advanced disease. And, and really, in order to achieve clinically relevant anti-cancer responses, we're really going to have to look at utilising these um, therapeutic strategies that can kill tumour cells in an immunogenic manner and integrate these reagents with therapeutic modalities that can promote um, the, these immunological responses, either through promoting antigen-presenting cell function, promoting the cytotoxic uh, activity of um, uh, effector cells such as NK cells and T cells, but more importantly, we're also going to have to look at trying to reset the immunosuppressive environment of the, tumor, uh, the, of the tumors, because this is most likely the most uh, dominant rate-limiting step to the development of effective anti-cancer immune response. So we really need to identify therapeutic agents that can also break down these immunosuppressive barriers within the tumours in order to allow for these immunological responses to really uh, develop and uh, mediate prolonged and robust um, anti-cancer immune responses. And this has really um, promoted uh, the rationale given the fact that these conventional therapies have been suggested to have immune stimulatory act um, activity. This has really driven um, this idea that um, the 
there may be significant therapeutic, therapeutic benefit from combining conventional first-line therapies with uh, immunotherapy. Essentially, this is a strategy which is looking to um, uh, essentially promote or teach our body's immune system to recognise and um, um, fight cancer. And certainly, where, where with an increased understanding of um, this uh, cancer immunity cycle and the identification of important regulatory elements that can prevent the development of effective anti-tumour immunity, we're starting to identify very promising um, therapeutic targets um, in this cycle that we can potentially use in combination with chemotherapy, uh, with various first-line therapies in order to promote anti-tumour immunity. And this is just showing you the level of activity that's going on in this work, uh, both in uh, the preclinical setting and the clinical setting. Um, the work that's going on in the clinical setting is extremely exciting at the moment, where they're actually looking at the development of combination strategies, employing chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy, with immunotherapeutic strategies, including the use of vaccinations, adoptive T-cell immunotherapy, essentially where they're isolating immune cells from patients, manipulating these cells ex vivo with, uh, to enhance the anti-cancer activity, and then re infusing these back into the patient, essentially providing the patient with a larger army of immune cells that have the capacity to respond to and mediate and um, uh, control cancers. But a field that is very rapidly developing and showing very uh, um, uh, uh, significant therapeutic promise is the development of these antibody-based immunotherapeutic strategies. Essentially, these are antibodies, monoclonal antibodies that are specifically engineered to target very, various co-stimulatory molecules or inhibitory receptors on the surface of immune cells in order to promote their, their um, anti-cancer activity. Um, of these, the, um, ones that, the two pathways that are gaining significant um, attention are the, um, the targeting of the checkpoint inhibitory pathways, essentially, that play a primary role in dampening immune responses. Um, these include um, the, the programmed DEATH1 receptor, as well as its ligand, pd one and the, the co-inhibitory receptor, um, uh, CTLA4. Okay, so just as a way of um, overview of these uh, two um, inhibitory um, pathways and how the, the antibodies to these pathways can promote anti-tumor immunity, both of these receptors are, are co-inhibitory receptors. They are upregulated upon T cell activation and their activity is um, really based and focused based on where their, their ligands are most dominant. Interesting, in this regards, the anti-CTLA-4 CTLA is upregulated within around about 48 to 72 hours of T cell activation. It's its inhibitory actions are mediated through outcompeting uh, the co-stimulatory receptor CD28 for its ligand B7. Through doing this, it can actually dampen um, the, the T cell, um, the activity of the T cell, and dampening the ensuing um, uh, immune response. Now, while this is critically important in, in uh, preventing the development of autoimmune responses in the setting of cancer, this can have a very profound effect in limiting the development of prolonged anti-tumor immune responses. So, an antibody to targeted towards CD TLA4, which can inhibit its capacity to bind this ligand and, and limit the, the stimulatory activity of CD28, potentially can prolong the survival of anti-cancer immune responses and, um, and, and the generation of more robust responses, and certainly the preclinical results associated with the study of the anti-cancer activity of these antibodies to CTLA4 have been quite profound and certainly pushed the clinical development of these, uh, these antibodies. Now, uh, B7 is not so prominently expressed within tumours or peripheral um, settings, so uh, the, the activity of CTLA-4 is thought to be primarily restricted to, a, to within the priming phase of uh, the T-cell um, response. In contrast, the um, PD-1, PD-1 is, uh, is upregulated very early on um, in the uh, T-cell activation. Its expression is actually upregulated upon antigen exposure. And increased antigen exposure generally correlates with increased PD-1 expression. So PD-1 expression is often thought to be um, connected with T-cell exhaustion. Um, so, and its uh, inhibitory actions are more so prominent within the periphery and within the actual tumour microenvironment, given that its ligands are most dominant in these sites. PD-1 has two um, inhibitory ligands, that being pd one and pd 2 pd one is thought to be the most dominant suppressive ligand um, of this pathway. It is often highly expressed within the tumour microenvironment, um, and, uh, and as well as this, PD-1, as well as being expressed on um, uh, tumour infiltrating lymphocytes, it's also expressed on T regulatory cells. And signalling through PD-1 and T regulatory cells is thought to alter the regulatory function of T regulatory cells. So by blocking this pathway, we can potentially 
potentially prolong um, or um, enhance anti-tumor responses within the actual, during the actual effective phase. So it's believed that the CTLA-4 is much focused around promoting the priming phase of the T cell response, whereas P blockade of the PD-1 will essentially promote the effective phase of the T cell um, response. And certainly there are now antibodies that can, can inhibit this PD-1, pd one uh, ligand, both targeting the PD-1 receptor as well as the ligand itself. Um, there is really, at this current moment of time, still not know, much known about the mechanisms of action of um, uh, anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 from a cellular kind of point of view. However, there is some indication to suggest that signaling through these um, inhibitory receptors can actually draw uh, the binding of phosphatases to the TCR receptor as well as cosimetry molecules, which can limit um, their signaling activity and alter their, um, the survival of these, uh, these, uh, these T cell responses or the length of these T cell responses. So given the, um, the success of uh, these uh, blocking antibodies to checkpoint inhibitors, uh, many companies or well, a number of companies have looked to develop um, therapeutic antibodies or humanised antibodies towards these targets, uh, some of which are shown here. Um, and as you can see, quite a number have been generated, but the only one that's been actually clinically approved or FDA um, or, or is, is that of ipilimumab, which is an antibody that's targeting uh, the CTLA-4 uh, receptor. And this is certainly showing very profound found um, clinical activity. Um, uh, the uh, given the, the preclinical success of these reagents, a lot of um, clinical uh, work is going on um, in this area in a number of, uh, of cancer, settings of, of cancer, and certainly these are showing very profound um, therapeutic um, uh, responses, which is really driving um, this, uh, the persistence of this uh, the field and the success of this field. And I, and I have no doubt, based on the results that are going to come through on the efficacy of anti-PD-1 and pd one antibody in these various kind of settings that in, not, in the not too uh, distant future, that antibodies to the PD-1 and pd one will be, uh, become uh, uh, first-line uh, therapeutic strategies for the treatment of various cancers, particularly that of melanoma. So I just wanted to show you some examples of the very dramatic responses that um, have been seen in the clinic with regards to the treatment of, um, with the use of anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab therapy. Uh, what's interesting in the context of anti-CTLA-4 therapy is that while it has a very um, profound um, effect in, um, in melanoma, as you can see, this is the patient presented with clear uh, melanoma um, lesions and that this was dramatically reduced uh, following uh, anti-CTLA-4 therapy. What's interesting is that the progression of response to this uh, therapy uh, is, is, is not so is quite different in the sense that we do see um, progression of this disease um, post treatment, and this is likely due to the fact that this reagent can invoke inflammatory immune uh, inflammatory responses that can actually support tumor growth. But subsequently, this um, adaptive um, responses can kick in to uh, to um, to contribute to the clearance of the, the this disease. Um, and this has also been evident in the setting of um, metastatic melanoma, where you can see clear um, lesions like the increase in um, and tumor lesions within the liver of this patient post ipilimumab therapy. However, um, 20, 20 weeks to 36 weeks um, uh, following treatment, you can see clear regression and quite significant regression of the disease. So certainly there's been very profound effects, and this is quite striking that a single uh, therapeutic agent that can target one checkpoint inhibitory pathway can have such a dramatic um, uh, effect in the, uh, in the um, on the anti-tumor immune responses and really shows how dominant these immunosuppressive pathways are in preventing the development of effective anti-cancer immune responses. Interestingly, given the fact that anti-CTLA-4 is thought to act within the priming activation phase, whereas um, anti-PD-1 or pd one therapy is thought to promote T cell responses or specifically tumor-specific responses within the tumor microenvironment, this provided some rationale to consider using um, the two reagents in combination. Given the fact that both of them hit different elements of this, this, uh, this cycle, they felt that this wouldn't contribute to, to further enhanced um, toxicities associated with administration of these reagents. Um, and while the results are very preliminary and at this stage not enough uh, patients have uh, been treated um, with this uh, particular combination strategy, they have shown in a small cohort of patients that uh, when you combine these two reagents together that you do see enhanced um, activity of these reagents compared to the single therapeutic treatments. And most strikingly was that half the patients um, that received this combination treatment, um, they obtained, there was a, an 80% an reduction in their, their their tumours, um, and this tended to be a very rapid response and prolonged response. So certainly um, this was an exciting um, and uh, uh, proof of principle um, uh, study. 
Um, and interestingly, as well as that, they identified that patients that did uh, had pdl one negative tumours were also responsive um, to this uh, therapeutic approach, as currently, at the moment, they're looking to utilise uh, tumour cell expression of pdl one as a potential biomarker of response to this therapeutic um, strategy. Notably, there, were some, there was an increased level of immune-associated toxicities with this combined therapy compared to the single agents alone. However, these were, were, to were, were manageable um, uh, toxicities. So, so this is all well and good, and certainly this is showing very profound therapeutic effects with antibody-based immunotherapeutic strategies for promoting anti-cancer immune responses uh, to cancer. However, I believe that the curative activity of these uh, immune monitoring agents will be significantly improved um, through combining them with um, other uh, first-line uh, treatment strategies, such as that of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And one of the elements in my lab, which I'm particularly, uh, which I'm currently working on, is looking at studying the, the therapy potential of combining uh, radiation therapy together with antibody-based immunotherapy for the treatment of cancer with a hypothesis that the immunoadjuvant properties of radiation therapy will promote not only the local effects of, of, of immunotherapy but the systemic um, uh, treatment of metastatic disease. The rationale for employing radiation therapy together with antibody-based immunotherapy is several fold. Uh, interestingly, for a long time, radiation therapy um, was thought to mediate its effect independent of the immune system, but now it's believed that radiation therapy can actually kill tumour cells in a manner that can engage immune effector mechanisms. This can either be, and this seems to correlate with the, the level of radiation um, uh, administered. At low doses, it's thought to, to alter the, or normalise the vasculature of the tumours, which can correlate with increased um, and more proficient infiltration of, uh, of immune cells into the tumour microenvironment. We can get increased um, uh, T cell repertoire um, that can respond to the cancer through the liberation of uh, new immunogenic um, uh, antigens. And more so at high dose radiation therapy, it's been identified that the tumour cells can be killed in such a manner that can evoke the release of uh, immunomodulatory factors that can promote um, adaptive immune responses that can contribute to the control of the disease. So we've looked to, to um, uh, capitalise on these immunoagent effects of radiation therapy by combining it with antibody-based uh, immunotherapy. We've looked to combine radiation therapy with um, co-stimulatory molecules, including that of CD40 and CD137. So essentially they're targeting molecules to promote T-cell activation. Um, however, the most profound combination that we've worked with is um, uh, the use of anti-CD137 therapy targeting the coast, uh, this co-stimulatory molecule together with antibodies targeting the PD-1 inhibitory receptor. So essentially with the view that, that we can strongly promote uh, um, uh, T cell activity through um, stimulating their activity as well as breaking down potential inhibitory um, pathways that can uh, dampen this response, as well as using the PD-1 in order to break down or reset the immunosuppressive uh, nature of the tumour microenvironment in order to permit for these, uh, these responses to, uh, to establish, given the fact that it's thought that PD-1 can influence T regulatory cell activity as well as the activity of other cells in the body, in the, in the tumour microenvironment. So this is just a demonstration of the, the kind of the, level, the type of result that we can achieve by combining radiation therapy together with antibody-based immunotherapy. Uh, essentially, this is a model of, um, of, of solid breast cancer. Uh, we implanted the 83 black 6 derived um, tumour line into the mammary fat pad of immune compromise. Uh, uh, immune competent mice. We allowed the tumour to establish to around about the size of a, a pea. And then we, uh, we treated with a single dose of 12 gray radiation therapy, which would be, I suppose would be more representative of a high dose um, radiation treatment, and combined this with the use of, uh, the, of uh, immune monitoring antibodies targeting PD-1 and the, the CD-137 um, co-stimulatory receptor. And essentially what we did was we monitored tumour growth over time as a, a measure of therapeutic response to this treatment strategy. I should note that the these 83 tumours express high levels of PDL1 um, upon implantation into the mice, and this is likely in response to uh, interferon gamma. So importantly, this is the growth of the AT3 tumours in the control mice. When we treated them with the single um, immunomodulatory antibodies, we found that they had very limited um, activity. The activity of anti pd one was particularly striking given the fact that these tumours expressed very high levels of pd one yet it demonstrated no single agent activity. When we combined the, the two um, immune modulating antibodies, we did find enhanced control of these tumours. Uh, however, this was relatively short-lived, but it did indicate that these antibodies had the capacity to re-engage um, anti-tumour immunity within these, uh, these tumours to, to mediate some level of control. 
What was most striking, however, is when we combined it with radiation therapy, and this is high dose, but we were using a, a, a non-curative um, dose of radiation therapy to really get a better understanding of, of the, the combined effects of um, radiation therapy and immunotherapy. Importantly, we were able to show that radiation therapy was able to increase the therapeutic efficacy of both anti-CD1-2-7 and anti-PD-1 therapy, and certainly this was quite striking given that there was no single agent activity of anti-PD-1 in this model. But most striking was the fact that when we combined radiation therapy with these two antibodies that we were able to achieve a 100% rejection rate. As well as that, we were able to re-challenge these mice with a second dose of tumour, um, and these mice were fully capable of rejecting this second challenge, suggesting that this combination approach had effectively evoked an immunological um, memory response. We can also demonstrate similar efficacy when we combine um, these, uh, these um, immunological reagents with fractionated radiation therapy as well. So this is just showing the, the potential um, um, uh, uh, the therapeutic potential of combining radiation therapy with antibody-based immunotherapy. And this is now, this approach has been actively pursued in the clinic um, and certainly I'm now involved in a, a clinical trial which is actually to start up at the Peter Mac um, in June of this year where they're looking to combine radiation therapy with ipilimumab therapy for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. So I, my work is progressing in this area. I'm now particularly interested um, in uh, better assessing uh, the immuno immunoagent effects of radiation therapy. I feel that by better understanding how radiation therapy can effectively kill and evoke immunological responses, we'll be in a better position to um, develop more rational, rationalised um, strategies for combining radiation therapy with immunotherapy. And we'll also be able to, uh, to potentially identify other therapeutic targets that may work more proficiently uh, with uh, radiation treatment. And certainly, as we learn more more about the, the um, factors that can activate or inhibit um, T cell function, I think uh, this field is, is going to rapidly uh, continue to e expand. So just to um, uh, conclude, um, so we are now, uh, it's now very clear and there's significant preclinical and clinical evidence to support the idea that that both the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system can play a very prominent role in influencing um, the evolution of, 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 of cancer and that it's likely that the infiltration of immune cells into the tumour microenvironment is going to have a key role in um, the, for prognostic and predictive um, purposes um, and it's going to significantly influence the way in which uh, can, uh, patients with transfer, uh, cancer are treated uh, in the future. However, we have to be aware of the fact that the, the tumour is actively trying to to suppress or dampen these immunological responses and that we need to find ways of breaking down these immunosuppressive barriers in order to make the tumour microenvironments more conducive um, to uh, uh, immunologic, uh, immune control. And I think this is where cancer immunotherapy is going to have a very dominant role to play. But it is going to be important that we optimise the sequence and dosing of these various treatments in order to ensure that we achieve the most effective and safe responses um, uh, with these agents uh, for the treatment of um, of us. Uh, of, of cancers. So I'm going to leave it there and take any questions um, and thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that for uh, Doctor, excuse me, why uh, in Australia have more uh, cancer uh, about other countries, for example, skin cancer, uh, breast cancer, and for men? What uh, the reason Australia have high cancer in the other country? I think when you come, uh, certainly in the context of, of melanoma, it's likely because of the fact that, that we have high levels of exposure to the sun and the way that people have been brought up in the past. As a result, with people living longer, these uh, the incidence of like melanoma is certainly increasing. So certainly we're more prone to, to um, uh, uh, certain cancers like that of, can of melanoma. Uh, the incidence of, of uh, breast cancer and other cancers, I'm not quite, uh, with regards to cancer versus Australia versus other countries, I'm not quite sure of the difference in incidence of those two and what would dictate that, whether that's environmental or um, uh, dietary kind of elements, um, I'm not quite sure. Especially in the testimony of high cancer in the world. Thank you so much. Yes, can you just talk a little bit more about how blocking the interaction between immune cells and the antibodies that increases the immune response? 
So, so with the regards to um, uh, blocking CTLA-4, essentially, given that CTLA-4 can dampen immune responses by removing the, the necessary co-stimulatory signals, by blocking that, the C4, CTLA-4 from achieving that, it's allowing for the T-cell responses to, to improve promoting T-cell survival as well as prolonging those responses. So you actually, and it also can increase, given that the fact it's not necessarily tumour-specific, it can broaden, like, act upon a, a broad array of... of um, T cell responses. So you've got a, a broader T cell repertoire that can now respond it's, it, and it's expanding that kind of pool of cells that can respond to that therapy. Whereas with PD1 therapy, given the fact that the PD1 is basically a, a, a associated with T cell exhaustion, by blocking that, that inhibitory pathway, that can kind of re engage that um, uh, T cell activity within the tumor microenvironment. It also can limit the capacity of uh, cells like that of T regulatory cells and other cells and PDL1 expressed on tumor cells from damping their activity. So essentially, it's prolonging their response and allowing for expansion of those responses both within the secondary lymphoid organs and within the tumor microenvironment. So those normal interactions, CTLA. Four. Four. Yep. Those are usually inhibitory. They are inhibitory pathways. So the CTLA-4 plays a critical role in controlling um, uh, autoimmune responses. So in mice that are deficient for CTLA-4, they have very profound autoimmune um, uh, activity. In the context of uh, PD-1 um, therapy, again, given the fact that it, it, it dampens those effector kind of like um, pathways, and again, that's been associated with uh, um, maintaining peripheral um, tolerance. Uh, uh, so, essentially, they play an important role in controlling autoimmune peripheral tolerance, but in the context of uh, cancer, it can significantly dampen the prolonged therapy response that can be achieved. Uh, uh, enjoyed your talk very much. You just actually mentioned autoimmune. Um, what other, has anyone sort of gone as far as looking at the ramifications with the systemic modulation of the immune response? For, for I mean, you talked a little bit, you had a list, I think, of um, side effects that I don't recall of the immune issues there, but... Yeah, so, so a lot of these reagents have been, um, they have been associated with liver toxicity um, and uh, also issues with the heart as well and pneumonia. Um, so there are associated toxicities and they, but they tend to be controllable. But uh, we, the problem with uh, the mouse models is a lot of these autoimmune associated issues are not really are not very evident. Um, and so the, the, a lot of this work that's moved into the clinic is they've gone in blind with regards to the potential toxicities of some of these agents. Um, and uh, I think they're learning along the way as to kind of like what potential toxicities are associated with these agents. There are quite broad kind of responses, but they tend to be manageable or at least tolerable uh, kind of uh, toxicities. Maybe just to follow that up, but maybe a question on that. With the treatment schedule of the, the, in, the, in the clinical trials, you seem to suggest that they had a very short term treatment and then they seem to, to cure. Is that part of the idea <coughs> behind trying to stop some of these? Uh, potential also problem. Yeah, I say, again, I think uh, there's been a lack of guidance with regards to how best to utilise these reagents. I think a lot of the treatment strategies have been dictated by the companies that have developed them. Um, the short course treatment is, is likely to be associated with kind of reduced toxicity. Um, and the fact that if you can engage that immunological response, that may be uh, sufficient to kind of drive long-term kind of responses, which they are actually seeing. They're seeing durable responses up to over a year, particularly with the anti-PD-1 um, therapeutic strategy. Yeah, it seems almost that the patients, again, I'm not sure if I interpreted it right, the tumours were progress, uh, regressing after the treatment had stopped. So how did you know when to stop the treatment if the tumour's actually growing? It's sort of yeah, it's a real challenge with uh, the anti ctla 4 therapy, well, the ipilimumab um, treatment. And uh, certainly, I mean, when we speak to the clinicians at the Peter Mac um, who are actually utilising this reagent, they, they talk of the extreme toxicities that are actually associated with this drug. Um, the patients have to be very closely monitored when they're on this, the, this potential therapy. It is interesting that the actual, uh, and I think some of those toxicities are associated with the, the inflammatory response that is actually evoked um, through treatment with these agents. Um, but what's, and I think that's where the main toxicities are arising. I think the, the actual um, adaptive kind of immune responses that subsequently ensue to the, in response to these inflammatory are not necessarily those that are mediating um, the toxicities uh, that um, they've described today. Question over there. Uh, you just behind you. 
Um, do you have any data on how the like, anti-CLA-4 therapy or the anti-PD therapy um, has an effect on recurrence rates of cancer like melanoma over a longer period of time? Like, do they come back as frequently? Um, I, th I think that at the moment it's too preliminary to actually, but there is evidence to suggest that these, uh, the cancer uh, can, does progress uh, following treatment with these uh, single uh, immunomodulatory agents. But, and I think that's because of the fact that cancer is such a heterogeneity disease, and so as a result, you do still get overgrowth of tumour cells that are poorly immunogenic. They don't mount a very strong and, uh, um, anti tumour immune response, and so you still will potentially get outgrowth of, of tumour cells that just um, can't be controlled by the immune system. And I think that's where combining these reagents with um, cytotoxic therapies like that of radiation therapy could address this issue because essentially you're altering the immunogenic status of the tumour microenvironment. You're getting a liberation of a broader array of tumour antigens, a broader T-cell repertoire that can now respond. And so as a result, I'd say you, you'll get a far broader effect of these immunomonitory agents on um, the, the cancers, uh, given the fact that you're altering that immunogenic status. So I think that's where the long-term benefit of these immunomonitory is going to be really seen when used in combination with first-line therapies like radiation. I guess I've been intrigued by the targeting of melanoma, I guess, in renal cancer as ones that are thought to have quite an immunological kind of response. Is there any kind of understanding why those particular tumours compared to, you know, a lot of other tumours seem to get even spontaneous immune responses? So. Yeah, I mean, those cancers have been uh, long thought to be quite immunogenic um, uh, cancers, so they do tend to express uh, tumour antigens that can evoke immunological responses to, um, uh, to, the, to the cancers. And this is likely associated with the genomic instability of these cancers. So as a result, they're undergoing uh, constant change and as a result, producing and presenting new antigens um, on their surface, which is uh, engaging kind of over time new, um, new uh, um, adaptive kind of type immune responses. So I think uh, it tends to be that these uh, the cancers that tend to be most responsive to these immunomonitory kind of um, uh, treatments are those that are quite immunogenic and are quite genomically unstable. Uh, so you briefly mentioned that vaccination was a treatment or strategy for cancer. How does one choose an antigen to develop? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's, the vaccination field has been uh, really challenged um, by this concept of immuno, immunosuppression and, um, and the clinogenic uh, nature of, of, of cancers. And certainly I think this is, a, it's, it's, it's still progressing this field, but it's still met with a number of challenges. And I think there's still a lot of uh, kind of in vitro assay kind of like systems utilising um, antibody-based detection probes and um, uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes obtained from, from the patients in order to identify which uh, peptides potentially evoke the strongest immunological responses. But vaccines are certainly, uh, their efficacy has been significantly compromised by these regulatory elements associated with this um, uh, uh, immune kind of cancer immunity cycle, as well as the very dominant immunosuppressive mechanisms that are going on within the tumor microenvironment. But it's likely that the efficacy of these vaccines could potentially be improved through combined use with immune monitory agents like that of PD-1 and CTA-4, particularly that of PD-1. I come back to that rather you know, dramatically terrible that Yep. Um, you, and again, you, you mentioned that uh, treatment with radiotherapy in combination is a sensible idea, the exposure of uh, danger signals at the same time. In that example, well, was, there, was it on its own, or was it, was it a standard of care? That was in its own right. Um, there's been one um, case study that's actually um, demonstrated, because the idea is that the radiation therapy or, or um, cytotoxic therapy will actually promote the efficacy of immunotherapy rather than vice versa, immunotherapy promoting the activity of chemo or radiation therapy. Um, and there has been one case study that um, has shown that a patient who um, was a, had a, their primary tumour resected, they subsequently were put on anti c 4 therapy. They observed that the patient was starting to progress on the treatment of anti c 4 therapy and they were starting to develop a lesion along their spine that was causing a lot of discomfort. So they actually subsequently treated this patient with radiation therapy and, and um, found that the all of a sudden, the, the lesions within um, other sites within the body um, started to respond to anti-C2A4 therapy. 
um, and there were certainly a few signatures to suggest that they they'd actually uh, the radiation therapy had promoted um, the the efficacy of, of um, um, the anti type four in this kind of context. So there is certainly evidence to suggest that um, you can uh, promote these uh, immunological responses through the use of the cytotoxic therapy. One last question. Uh, may I ask, with your own radiotherapy work, what's, a, what's the source of radiation and do you just deliver a localised dose to the oh, I should point that implantation? Out. Yeah, so we are actually using electron beams for, for the um, treatment. We're actually using the, the equipment that the patients are treated on at the PETAMAC uh, for our radiation uh, therapies, and it is a localised um, treatment that we administer. So the mice are actually um, are placed under lead shields, um, and so we are only exposing uh, the, the, the tumour site to, to radiation therapy. Yes, All right, with that, then, uh, just very simply, thank you,